You know, prior to the social media era in which we now live, the most common form of communicating with people outside of our immediate vicinity was by handwritten correspondences like letters and notes and cards. But in today's time, letter writing has become a lost art. With technology at our fingertips, letters and messages have been condensed down to tweets, texts, or emails, which all have a short lifespan. But the benefit of a handwritten letter is that you can read it, save it, and then reread it for many years to come. In fact, the letter will stand still in time as a remembrance to what was going on at that time it was written. And in today's message title, A Letter from Christ, we'll see how a letter written over 2,000 years ago still just as relevant today as it was the day that it was written. But before we move on to our text, please bow with me in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we come to you today in the holy and in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we expound upon the scripture passage in Revelation chapter 3, that you will speak to our hearts so that we will have a deeper understanding of how you really don't want us to be a lukewarm church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The scripture for today's message is found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Word of the Lord reads on this wise, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things say the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Amen. A letter from Christ. Now I'm sure that many of you have seen, written, or read a letter before. And you know that it is common for composed letters to have a basic structure. For instance, they have a heading, an opening, the body, and a closing. And in today's message, I'll be discussing three elements that were included in a letter from Christ in our text today, and they are First, the writer. Second, the accusation. And third, the warning. So let's start with our first outline, which is the writer. Verse 14 of our text says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, in this verse, we have the opening of the letter from Christ, which includes an introduction on who is initiating the writing of the letter. And he is described by four different titles. As we look at this verse, we see that he is called the Amen, the Faithful, the True Witness, and the Beginning of the Creation of God. So from these four descriptive titles, we realize that it is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who instructs the writing of this letter. And he has chosen the Apostle John to write the letter. Now, if you recall, it was the Apostle John who was the disciple that Jesus loved. It was John who was the only disciple at the cross. John was the only one with Jesus Christ from the beginning of his earthly ministry up to his crucifixion. John, Peter, and James were part of the inner circle of Christ. It was John, his brother James, who during the ordination of the 12 apostles received the surname Sons of Thunder from Jesus himself. It was John, along with Peter and James, who were present at the transfiguration of Christ when his clothes turned white as light and his face shined as the sun. 
John was one of the disciples Jesus sent to prepare the upper room for the Passover meal. John was there when Jesus gave his upper room discourse and informed his disciples that there was a traitor at the table. And it was John whom the Lord loved so much so that he left his mother Mary into his care as he hung on the cross on a hill called Calvary. So you see, John was present at many of the pivotal points of Christ's earthly ministry. And now at this point in John's life, he had been arrested and thrown into a huge basin of boiling oil because of his preaching of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. But that didn't kill him. So after he was miraculously delivered from death, the emperor banished him to the Isle of Patmos, an isolated, barren, rocky island in the Mediterranean that was only about 10 miles long and six miles wide. And it was on the Isle of Patmos that Revelation chapter one records how John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the spirit means that Christ put John in a trance and then gave him a deep spiritual experience that lifted his mind and spirit above the world and put him in the very presence of Christ himself. And when John saw him, he said that his head and hair was white like lamb's wool, white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like burnt brass and his voice was as the sound of many waters. And when John saw all of this, he fell at the Lord's feet as though he was dead. But Jesus touched him with his right hand and said, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and death. Then the Lord told John to write the things that he had seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And in chapter two and three of Revelation, the Lord instructs John to write seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor to address a specific issue related to that church. So John did as the Lord instructed and wrote the seven letters, starting with the letter to the church in Ephesus. And in his first letter to the church in Ephesus, the Lord let them know that they had forsaken their first love. In his second letter to the church at Smyrna, the persecuted church, the Lord encouraged them not to fear suffering. In the third letter to the church at Pergamon, the Lord cautioned them about living a spiritually corrupt and compromised lifestyle. In his fourth letter to the church of Thyatira, the Lord advised them against tolerating singing, false prophets, and the teaching of false doctrine. In his fifth letter to the church of Sardis, the Lord told them that although they looked alive hourly, inwardly they were spiritually dead. And in his sixth letter, the Lord told Apostle John to commend the church of Philadelphia for their faithfulness, perseverance, and for patiently enduring despite their limited strength. So John is the writer of each of these letters. And now in verse 14 of our text, John is told to write a seventh and final letter to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, which more than likely is the pastor or spiritual leader of the church in Laodicea. And in verse 15, the Lord goes on to give John the information to include in the body of his seventh and final letter. Now, Laodicea was an extremely wealthy and prosperous city. It was a flourishing city with a financial and banking center, clothing manufacturer, and a famous medical school renowned for the ISAF, which it produced. And because the Laodiceans were so wealthy and prosperous, they thought, they thought now that they did not need help from anyone, including God. Now that's a very dangerous state of mind to have. So in verse 15 of our text, the Lord tells John to write these words in his letter to the Laodiceans. I know thy works, 
that thou art neither cold nor hot. And I would thou were cold or hot. And this takes us to our second outline, which is the accusation. Outline number two, the accusation. Notice this letter from Christ written by the apostle John is to be sent to the pastor of the church in Laodicea. This was because he is the one who is ultimately responsible for the state of that church. So Christ expects the pastor to be the first to heed the warning against lukewarmness and half-hearted commitment. Then Christ expects the pastor to take the message of the Lord to the church and declare his warning to his believers. The point to see is that the pastor is held accountable by Christ for the indifference and complacency of the believers. He expects the pastor to arouse himself and repent and to arouse the believers and lead them to repentance and wholehearted commitment. The church at Laodicea was the one church that Christ had nothing good to say about. He wanted them to get it together. Just imagine now a church that may as well not exist, a church that has no good within its body whatsoever, a church that does, not, does no good at all. So what was it that made the church of Laodicea so bad, so useless and so worthless? Well, the accusation is in verse 15 of our text. It says that they were neither cold nor hot. So they were lukewarm. And lukewarmness, which means that the church was in different, complacent, lethargic, self-satisfied, half-hearted and neutral. The church and its believers were only halfway committed to Christ and only half-hearted in their worship and service for him. Look at this. To Christ, there is no good whatsoever in a lukewarm, half-committed believer or church. They had been blessed financially and had blessings overflowing. And that's why the Lord knew he needed to take them to the woodshed. And when the Lord takes us to the woodshed, he know exactly what we need. If he tells us that we need 10 strikes, we need 10 strikes. He know that nine won't get the job done and 11 will kill us. What the Lord wanted more than anything was for them to become passionate about their relationship with him. He wanted them to live the greatest commandment. You know, the one to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And although this letter was written centuries ago to the Laodiceans, the words of this letter are still very relevant to many of our churches today. The actual church of Laodicea has passed away, but other Laodiceans' attitudes and conduct still exist, and in fact, has multiplied in our churches today. You see, the problem with this Laodicea church is that they were comfortable being a lukewarm church. In previous years, this church was a healthy, vibrant church on fire for the Lord. But over the course of years, they became lukewarm. The Lord tells John to write, I know thy works. In other words, don't nobody know you like I do. And some people think that you're better than what you are, but I know you. You think your work is excellent, but I know that you've fallen short and missed the mark by a mile. This church knew that the public could only read reports about how good they appeared to be. But Jesus didn't depend on a report. He knew for himself just how they really were. He knew what they did, how they did it, why they did it, and when they did it. And the same is true for us. Just because we go to church, carry our Bible, sit there singing songs of praise, and reading scripture by our heads in prayer, and listen to the gospel being preached, don't you think that the Lord don't know who we really are, what we've done, and when we did it? You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all other people all the time. And guess what? You can't fool God 
none of the time. And that's why in Christ's letter to the Laodiceans, he said, I know thy works. The Lord is watching and judging all churches, just like he did the church of Laodicea. And if he was to send a letter to your church today, what do you think that your letter would say? Would it be a letter to commend your church on your good works? Or would it say you need to get it together because you're lukewarm? And we must guard against being a lukewarm church. And one man asked the question, what is a lukewarm church? Well, it's a church that lacks energy, is opposed to excitement, and they show no joy for Christ at all. The condition of the Laodicea church was they were not scandalous, but they were not faithful believers either. They did not oppose the gospel, but they also didn't defend it. They weren't working mischief, but they weren't doing any good. They were not disgraceful, but they weren't holy either. They were not ungodly, but they were also not spiritual. The church of Laodicea was lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. But you know what? They were comfortable. And a comfortable church is a lukewarm church. And this is a horrible state because Jesus saw that this church was doing his work in a lackluster manner. And because of that, Jesus closes his accusation in verse 15 by saying, I would thou were cold or hot. Now, another way to describe lukewarm is that they were like room temperature water, not hot and not cold. And what do you need to do to make water room temperature? You know what you have to do? Absolutely nothing. You just let the hot water in a cup sit for a while. And guess what? It become lukewarm. And with cold water, you just let it alone. And eventually, it will also become lukewarm. But if you want the water to be hot or cold, you must do something like warm it up or cool it down. But to be lukewarm, you don't have to do anything. And that was the problem with the church of Laodicea. They had become so comfortable in their lukewarm state of just existing that they had lost their commitment to the Lord and were doing absolutely nothing. So in verse 16 of our text, Jesus gives them a warning. In verse 16 said, So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. And this verse leads us to our third and final outline for this text, which is the warning. Our last outline, the warning. In verse 16 of our text, the warning that Christ gives the Laodiceans is that he will spew them out of his mouth. Or when churches get into the condition of half-hearted faith, tolerating the gospel, but having a sweet tooth for error, they do more tearing down than building up the church. Cold makes us shiver, and great heat causes us pain. But a lukewarm bath is comfortable. The world is always at peace with a lukewarm church, because a lukewarm church is not out there confronting sin, trying to change the world. They are content to let the world come in and change them. The world sees them as a refuge for people who want an easy religion that enables them to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And a lukewarm church is always pleased with itself because it measures itself against itself and not the Lord. They are a church that is not expected to do much, give much, pray much, or to be very religious. The Laodicean church had no real joy in the Lord. It had its joy in itself. And the danger of their condition was that they were rejected by Christ. He said, I will spill thee out of my mouth. And though they disgusted, it was as though they disgusted him to the point of nausea. But in order to be spilled out, Church has to be first in his mouth. Churches are in Christ's mouth in several ways. They are used by him as his testimony to the world. He speaks to the world through our lives and ministry. 
makes the world see and know that there is power in the gospel of the grace of God. But when the church becomes neither cold nor hot, it does not speak because it can't. For there is no witness in the world for them. The Laodiceans were lukewarm. They were half faithful to Christ and God. So the Lord wanted them to get rid of their lukewarmness and mediocrity by refocusing their attention on him. Christ wants them to be zealous and to repent. Why? Because he loves them. He wants them to see the wrong, correct their behavior, and change their life. And it is out of his love for them that he chastened them. And in verse 19, Christ tells them that those who he loved, he chastens and disciplines. So the lesson for the Laodiceans as well as our churches today is that the church must, must not depend upon this prosperity, its rituals, abilities, energy, wealth, and resources. And no matter how prosperous a church is, it is not the creator nor the sustainer. Christ alone creates and sustains. The church's wealth and prosperity are meaningless and useless apart from being absolutely centered in Jesus Christ. Now in closing, let's heed the message in this letter from Christ. Be very careful to not become a lukewarm church. Let's be on fire for the Lord and let our service be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Let each of us be witnesses for Christ, always willing to tell a dying world about a living Savior. And remember that it was in a letter for Christ that first the writer, who was the apostle John was lifted into the very presence of Jesus Christ himself. And it was then given instruction to write the letter in our text to the Laodicean, as well as letters to the six other churches in Asia Minor. Second, the accusation. Lord accused the Laodiceans of being neither cold nor hot because of their affluence. They had become lukewarm and had committed to the Lord. They had grown comfortable in their wealth and position, making them complacent, believing that they didn't need anything more, including the Lord. Third, the one. Lord scolded the church of Laodicea for allowing their economic prosperity to cause their spiritual bankruptcy. And he wastes no time denouncing them for their lukewarm faith, warning them that he would spill them out of his mouth. Our text today gave us a picture of the church of Laodicea that is much like many churches today. Church filled with believers who are spiritually lukewarm, spiritually content without passion or spiritual drive, living with one foot in the world, one foot in the church. But Christ warns us, just like he warned the Laodiceans, that he would spit out lukewarm believers. He urges us to Keep seeking and serving him even after his hand has bestowed riches in our life. Verse 20 of this chapter of our text. Jesus encourages those in the church of Laodicea to open the door of their hearts and to let him in. And today Jesus Christ still stands before the door of the heart of man, knocking for man to open up and let him in. So why not open your heart up to let Christ enter in today. A letter from Christ. Thank you and may God bless you. Please bow with me in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we know that you deserve so much more than lukewarm Christians and a lukewarm church. And help us now to live up to our potential and to be the kind of people that you have called us out to be. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a prayer request, would like the Lord to invite the Lord into your life, or if you have any comment, please send me a Facebook message or use the contact us option available on our website at pmbcfellowship.org. You can also contact me with your questions on today's message. To give your tithes, offering, and donation, please visit pmbcfellowship.org. Click the Give button on the top right of the page. 
follow the instructions from there. Remember now, God loves a cheerful giver. Thanks again for tuning in and remember that the Laodiceans, they felt they needed nothing. They had all the world could give along with having a false sense of spiritual security. But when they, but what they failed to realize is that when anything supersedes your love and passion for Jesus, you become spiritually pitiful, poor, naked, and blind. Now, I look forward to you joining us on next Sunday at 11 a.m. here at the pastor's desk or on YouTube at PMBC Space Fellowship or seeing you in person for Sunday morning worship on site at Providence uh, Missionary Baptist Church in Montalva, Texas, being in accordance with the CDC guideline. Until then, I want you to take care and may God bless you.